Good morning, everyone. Thank you. God is good. Try it again. God is good. God is good. All the time. Yes, great. God is good. And I'm so glad to be here worshiping with you all. I want to thank you for inviting me and give thanks to God for the day for the joy of having my family here, my daughter Samira, my my wife Lisa, (laughs) and for being here with everyone and of having the joy yesterday to spend some time with the youth here for the Niagara Youth Festival and to be inspired by their energy and intellect. I would like to also acknowledge that we're standing on traditional ground of a variety of indigenous peoples and give thanks for their legacy that has shaped and continues to shape our nation. (laughs) So, I want to start with some current events. It's a bit of an exhausting time to be alive, is it not? Who here is that feeling nowadays that you kind of dread to read the news when you wake up in the morning? Every day it's kind of like, what's going to happen next? Hurricane, forest fire, terrorist attack, refugee crisis, mass shooting. It just seems like bad news is coming at us at a ferocious pace. And many of us suffer from DTA, Donald Trump addiction. We know we need to stop paying attention to this man, but we just can't. Kind of like when the highway slows, when there's a car crash, and you know you really shouldn't look, but you just do anyways because you can't stop yourself. But in all seriousness, there's a lot of really scary things happening right now. You know, for me, those images of white supremacists marching with burning torches through an American city with faith leaders like Dr. Cornel West and other clergy and rabbis literally cowering inside a church as that mob walked by. Just chilling. It's scary times. And of course, part of that is the fact that we live in a world of a 24-7 news cycle where the bad news never stops coming. And we live in an age of social media where bad news and fake bad news can be constantly showing up and sent to us. But I think it's important to remember that the world, as much as it's full of wonder and grace, has always been a difficult place and there's always been a need for redemption. Someone I know who's quite well read and aware, you know, was telling me the other day, Kofi, you know, I'm so depressed. This is the worst time in history, at least since World War II. And I said, well, what about the 1980s? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, in the 80s, the Cold War was heating back up. We had a US president who was a media personality who loved slogans, who was saber rattling with US enemies, using race-based rhetoric for a massive war on drugs, cutbacks to social programs. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? There was a lot of violence in US cities. There was a war between Iran and Iraq, civil conflict in Latin America, South Africa. And I went on and on. He said, okay, 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 stop. And the point of it wasn't to say, history is horrible, it's always been terrible. But it is to say, listen folks, it's not the end of the world right now. Because literally I can go on Facebook and I can show you many a conspiracy that's going around right now saying, this is it, the end of the world, it's happening. And I would say, no, no, and no. The fact is, history goes through cycles. But that's the thing, for many of us, especially those like myself who were born in the 1980s or afterwards, the millennials, most of our life has been a constant refrain that things are getting better. And you see that after the Soviet Union fell, there have been less wars in the world. Crime has been steadily going down. There's been social progress for women, for LGBTQ rights, for ethnic minorities. Extreme poverty has been going down. And more people all over the world are enjoying more and more stuff material things. And so we began to believe that there was a trajectory that things would always just get better. And that was our mistake in thinking that progress was like a natural force. People said, hey, America has a black president. Racism must be on its way out. Hey, women have become the majority of people in post-secondary education. Sexism must be over. But in the last little while, we've got some tough reminders that human society can move forward, but it can also move backwards. Things can get worse. And the old demons that we thought were from the past, they can come back. 
The fact is, the kingdom of God, my friends, does not just drop down from heaven on us. God's dominion is not a miraculous intervention. It is a community built in collaboration and manifested through us, through human action as a conduit for God's love. And if we take our foot off the gas, if we step back and say, oh, you know, in the 1960s, they had to struggle so much for social justice. I'm glad they did, because my generation can now just enjoy. Then we have a problem. Because when good people stand idle, evil can reemerge. And around the world, a lot of change is happening in the makeup of our societies, in the type of jobs that exist, in how wealth is distributed, even in how our climate acts. And in time of change, people can get scared, people can make bad decisions, and people search for simple answers and leaders who give simple answers. Trump, Brexit, and I'm from Toronto, so I can say Rob Ford, a lot of that was driven by people scared of change and wanting a simple answer. So while this isn't the end of the world, I can say it's true, we're in a very uncertain and potentially dangerous time. And it's not where people thought we'd be in 2017, but that's the reality. So as people of faith, as Christians, what do we do? So let's take a moment to look at scripture and reflect. There were two readings that we heard today, and both helped me to understand this term that, you know, seems very complicated, but I think is really simple, this idea of contextual theology. The idea that our theology, meaning the way we understand God and God's word and its purpose for us, is shaped by our context. It's shaped by the world we live in and what's happening. And good theology, good approaches to understanding God's word, is all about taking that word and putting it into the context of what's happening today. So you remember those what would Jesus do bracelets? You know, I'd say contextual theology is kind of like asking, what would Jesus think? You know, what would Jesus think about how we treat people with disabilities? What would Jesus think about our response to climate change? What would Jesus think about the refugee crisis in the world? What would Jesus think about inequality or how we treat our indigenous Canadians? That's the way we can use our faith as a guide and a signpost in dangerous times to get an understanding, and then, of course, to act. And the Bible is this amazing book because, for me, I love it because it gives insight into the past like no other way. It can actually give us a taste of the emotions and perspectives of people from thousands of years ago who, like us, were struggling to understand what was God asking of them. And so the psalm that we heard today, it's that famous one, you know, by the rivers of Babylon. It's such a powerful piece of writing, it actually became a hit pop song. It also helped to inspire a new religion, Rastafari, a whole faith based on interpreting the condition of black folks in the new world by drawing parallels to the Jewish people in the Bible. So it's a powerful, powerful passage. And what was the condition of the folks who were writing that passage? Well, that was a dark time. The first temple, literally the house of God, had been destroyed by a foreign enemy. And the royal family and the elite of Israel had been taken away and carted off to a foreign place far away from their homes. Now, some amazing theology happened there in Babylon. Scholars say this is the time where Yahweh transformed from being a local Jewish god to the universal god of the cosmos. This is where that breakthrough that we call monotheism, the belief in one god for all people, happened but it took a lot of struggle and thinking and discussion to get there. And in this psalm, we get a lament of the Jewish people. We feel how angry, sad, and hurt they are about what happened. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? Here they are processing the pain of what had happened to them into beautiful religious verse. And you can just imagine those words. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land coming from refugees today? Whether they're in Italy sitting in detention centers or whether it's just up the highway in Quebec at the Olympic Stadium where literally hundreds of refugees are being held as we speak. It's a powerful verse. 
But that wasn't the full response. And this understanding of a God for all people didn't happen right away in Babylon. For there's a final part to this psalm. And it's a part I've never heard uttered in a united church. But after the lament and the sorrow, the writers of the psalm turn to a very human emotion, revenge. And they say, remember what has been done to us. And they call for God to come and strike down Babylon and do some pretty awful things to the children of Babylon. And in truth, to me, this scripture, I believe, is about a failure to fully grasp the message of God as his cry for help turns into a bloodthirsty wish for revenge. But if you understand the context of the pain and the destruction that the writers of this psalm may have seen with their own eyes, you can kind of understand the response. They may have seen their own families being harmed when Jerusalem fell. And so it would be natural. Why wouldn't God do the same to our enemies? This is our God. This happened to us. And today, it's easy sometimes when we see what's going on in the world to go to that response and to give in to cynicism. I've heard people say, well, you know, America's getting what they deserve with Trump. Or someone saying, you know, well, all these disasters that are happening, you know, that's God punishing this country. Or people said, you know what, we've destroyed the earth, climate change is what we deserve. This kind of nihilistic theology that explains away bad things by saying, you know, God's going to punish and even the scales. And even if that's us, I guess we deserve it. But there is another way, my friends, we can respond in our theology. So let's look at the chapter from Luke that we heard today, something they call the Nazareth Manifesto, where Jesus articulates his theology as a 12-year-old, no less. He lived in a difficult time, too. There was an emperor in Rome who was claiming he was divine and everyone needed to worship him, which, of course, for monotheists, for Jewish folks, was a big deal to be told that. There was an occupying army in Palestine. The Jewish elite were working with the conquerors, getting rich off of enforcing the Roman colonial system. And that gap between rich and poor that continues to be talked about across the Gospels was widening. And it would have been so easy for Jesus that day to have picked up a passage like Psalm 137 and read it out and said, this has happened to us and now we're going to get revenge. And the fact is, all over Palestine, you had preachers doing just that, claiming to be messiahs, claiming God's wrath was going to come and destroy the Romans and bring back the next kingdom. But this son of a carpenter chose to give a different message, to speak of dominion and respond to his time with a theology that spoke of freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, setting the oppressed free, proclaiming the year of God's favor. This was a call to action, not a call to revenge or violent revolution. But in Jesus' words in the temple that day and over his life, he showed a revolution of values, of community, a radical approach to including and welcoming everyone and creating a kingdom of love. So how can we respond to our times? What does Jesus think about what's going on now? What does Jesus want us to do? Well, if we take the scriptures and the gospels in specific and apply it to our context, the message is clear. Jesus calls us to act, to build community, to create empathy, and to speak out to power. The fact is, friends, in days like this, the world needs us. The world needs the United Church. The world needs the progressive Christian voice. Because for far too long, the Christian voice that has dominated the airwaves has been a voice of division, a voice condemning our blessed gay, lesbian, and trans family, condemning those who support a woman's right to choose, and attacking our Muslim brothers and sisters. What we need now is the other side of Christianity, the other approach to Christianity, to speak up as a church and as individuals. But where do we start? Some people say, well, you know, I'm not a political organizer. I'm not a political leader. I don't even really follow politics. And, you know, not all of us are activists. And maybe I'm a young person, and I don't feel I have that voice, or I don't know where to start. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts on how we can play our part in building this blessed community. One thing I talked about yesterday is to think globally but act locally. There was one young woman who was so passionate yesterday about access to fresh water. And that's a huge global issue. 
And, you know, the solution involves different continents and all levels of government and all this stuff. But we can start to tackle it here, in our own church, in our own community, by educating ourselves on the issue, by learning about the issues that face First Nations communities in the North around access to clean drinking water, learning about what's happening in the South, getting that education, but then it's about acting in our own context. Whether that's promoting water conservation, saying, can we see how we can use less water as a school, as a class, as a church? Maybe it's doing a campaign in your church or school to lessen the use of bottled water. Or maybe it's writing letters to government demanding action around access for fresh water. This is a model that works, thinking globally or nationally about issues, but then finding acts you can start with locally. And once you start winning small victories, you build your confidence. And that is how, throughout history, people, especially young people, have been able to transform their situation. Also, we can act around empathy. Empathy is that ability to walk in the shoes of others, to be able to feel and, and have connection to the emotions that other people are feeling. That's not a natural state. We do have some natural empathy. We all feel it for our parents, usually, and our family, for people who look like us. But radical love, that love Jesus spoke about, that love for people who don't look like us, for those who may not even like us, that's hard. That loving of your neighbor, it ain't an easy thing. It's a skill. It's an attribute of the heart. And whether it's people who supported Donald Trump, or people in Canada in Quebec, who supported the Quebec Values Charter, or people who supported Brexit in the UK. The research is clear. The highest support for anti-immigrant policies almost always come from communities with the least amount of immigrants. And that makes sense, because I truly believe to know each other is to love each other. And if we don't, then fear and distrust can take hold of our hearts. And so we can all start being a change by going outside of our comfort zones and seeking out ways to know and interact with people who are different from us. Maybe that's doing an event through your local church in partnership with your local mosque or synagogue. Maybe it's doing an exchange program with the First Nations community. Maybe it's welcoming refugees into your community or supporting the thousands of farm workers who come to Canada to pick food and crops for us but only have a fraction of the rights Canadian workers have. We need more empathy and we need more ways to build it. On top of that, the other thing you can do, especially if you're from someone who comes from a community of privilege, it might be you identify as white or European, it might be you're an able-bodied person, it might be you're someone who says that they're straight. These are all communities that have some power or privilege and we all have that in different ways. But if you have privilege of being part of a majority culture in Canada, that's fine. You were born into it. That's okay. It's not about feeling guilty. But how can you use that privilege for good? So myself, I have a lot of privilege. I have a PhD. You know, I had some fancy letters after my name on my business card. I was born to a middle-class family. I'm a person of color, but I'm very fair-skinned. I have a lot of privilege. And I'm also a man, and I'm a straight man. I've tried to use my privilege wherever I can to give back to help. I've used it to build a nonprofit that works for those on the margins in Toronto. I've been able to leverage the fact that my educational background can get me into certain places and connect me with certain people, to open up doors for the youth that I work with, to fight for them in ways to access resources that aren't there. And people will tell you, especially people of color or immigrants or the queer or disabled, People who are minorities will tell you, it is so tiring to always be the one speaking out against oppression for your community. It's so lonely to be that person of color always talking about racism. And in today's world, when you're that person who speaks out, what comes with it is Facebook threats, harassment, and all kinds of pressure. Something that is critical for people who are in minorities is to have allies speaking out for us. So if you're someone who is in the majority in whatever sense, wherever you can, speak out. Especially challenge if you hear people talking in ways that are discriminatory. 
whether it's something someone posted on Facebook, whether it's a comment someone makes at a family gathering, whether you're in the CAF at high school and someone says something about other groups, whether you're in your lunchroom at work. Speak out. Use the privilege you have in your own community to push for empathy and resist bigotry. Friends, could you do me a thing? Could you just raise your hands for a moment? Just raise your hands. Now take a good look at them. The truth is, these hands are the only hands that God has in this world. And it's through working together with these hands that God's kingdom will come. Through these hands, we can be a conduit for God's love. So let us build that dominion together. Let us be guided by a theology that challenges us to love more deeply, more radically, and more perfectly. Amen. Praise be to God.